Welcome to the Michigan Minds Podcast, a quick and informative analysis of today's top issues from University of Michigan faculty. Thank you so much for taking the time to join Michigan Minds today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So I'd love to go ahead and get started. Could you please introduce yourself and tell us about your role at the University of Michigan? Sure. Um, my name is Paige Sweet. I'm an assistant professor of sociology here at the University of Michigan. So I do research on gender-based violence, gender and sexuality. I teach graduate and undergraduate courses on social theory, gender-based violence, um, sociology of the body, and gender and sexuality. And in what areas does some of your research specifically focus? I focus mostly on domestic violence. So I write about, um, I have a, a book that looks at um, domestic violence survivors experiences of navigating systems. So how systems that are set up to help victims achieve autonomy and independence often end up reinforcing some of the problems that put them in violent situations to begin with. Um, and I also study gaslighting, um, which is what I think we're going to talk about today. So I have um, a couple projects that focus on gaslighting, where I interview people who've experienced gaslighting about their experiences of psychological abuse, um, both in intimate relationships and in places like the workplace. And gaslighting has become a popular term. And recently you spoke with Discover Magazine about what gaslighting can look like in relationships. As an expert and researcher on this topic, can you describe what gaslighting is and provide a few examples? Sure, great. Um, so gaslighting, it has become a really popular term. And sometimes when that happens, we sort of lose the specificity of what the term refers to. That can be a good thing because it means that more people have this vocabulary to talk about whatever they're experiencing. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes it means we don't really know what the term means when we use it. Um, so I think of gaslighting as when someone makes you seem or feel quote unquote crazy. Um, so I often talk about it as a form of psychological abuse. Um, and you know, usually if we're talking sort of casually with people, domestic violence victims, for example, they might refer to an experience they have with an abuser as quote unquote crazy making. So I often just describe it to people as the sort of crazy making form of abuse. That experience of someone kind of messing with your reality could be intentional, could be unintentional. The term gaslighting comes from the film Gaslight, um, which starred Ingrid Bergman and came out in the 40s. And that the term gaslight comes from the tactic that her abusive husband used against her in the film, where he would brighten and dim the gaslights. And then when she mentioned that she noticed this, he would tell her that she was imagining it and that she was crazy and that she belonged in an asylum. Um, and so it's that experience of someone sort of messing with your reality, when you sort of know something is happening that's wrong or bad, but someone's sort of convincing you that that's not the case. Um, so a couple examples might be in the sort of more micro or intimate context, if you tell your partner, you know, it makes me feel really bad when you do X, like undermine me in front of the kids, for example and your partner responds, I don't do that, I would never do that, you're crazy, you're bipolar, um, you're sort of seeking attention again, you're making this up. Um, that kind of thing would be gaslighting, messing with your sense of reality and sort of flipping the script. Um, gaslighting can also happen in a sort of slightly more macro context. Um, so let's say you experience racial harassment or discrimination at work and you go tell your employer about this, but your employer tells you, no, you know, we're really known for our like diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. It seems like you're being too sensitive. You didn't really experience racism here. That would be another good example of gaslighting, and I think it's quite common, um, because basically it's saying that what you've experienced, um, the causes of that are not what you think they are. Um, the causes of that are all in your head. Um, and that's how I tend to think of gaslighting is when you experience something and someone tells you, mm, no, you're actually, that's like a little bit, you know, in, in your head, that didn't really happen. Um, we know that gaslighting is really common in 
domestic violence relationships and abusive relationships. That's that experience is sort of denying abuse, minimizing the effects of abuse, distorting reality so that the abuser doesn't have to take responsibility for abuse. In my research, I come across a lot of victims who've experienced their abusers making them look unstable um, in front of police or in court. Um, and so using those kinds of authoritative institutions to sort of slash at someone's credibility to say like, no, you're not a real victim. You're making this up. This is sort of like you're exaggerating it in your head. Um, and often that can come through. So, for example, many of the Black women that I've interviewed have experienced their abuser making them out to be the abuser in front of police and sort of drawing on stereotypes about Black women as particularly aggressive or loud, for example, in order to discredit them in front of police. Um, and so those, as you can imagine, when gaslighting happens in those kinds of spaces, it can have real devastating effects on people's access to resources and their ability to sort of pursue um, rights and resources that should be available to them as a victim. And so I often talk about gaslighting as operating on along lines of power differentials. So it really matters, you know, who has more power and control in an intimate relationship. Um, and gaslighting sort of happens along those lines, right, of existing power and control relationships. Thank you for sharing those examples to really help all of us understand exactly some of the different ways that this can appear. And I imagine that this impacts mental health quite a bit. Could you discuss that relationship between gaslighting and mental health a little bit? Sure. Yeah, I think that's a great connection to make. So the people who I interview about their experiences of gaslighting often experience a lot of isolation around this experience, and that can have really um, detrimental effects on their um, sense of self, on their sense of well-being, on their ability to sort of connect with others. So I think that, um, as one of my interviewees put it, gaslighting breeds on isolation. So if some, if this is happening to you repeatedly in your relationship where your partner is making you feel like you're making things up or that things that are happening to you are not really happening to you or that things are happening to you because you're quote unquote crazy, um, and you're isolated, it means that you don't have anyone else to share this with and say like, wait, is my partner right about this? Like you need that, those other people right in your life who can sort of validate your reality and say like, mm, no, that doesn't sound quite right. Like it sounds like your partner is maybe um, manipulating things a little bit. But if you're really isolated, as many victims, let's say, of domestic violence are, um, if you're extremely isolated, um, it can be impossible to get those sort of counter narratives from friends and family, other trusted people to sort of validate your own experience of reality. And that can be really devastating. And it just compounds isolation. And we know that isolation especially for older folks, for example, is a central cause of sort of depression um, and other mental health effects. So I think that's a really key sort of variable here is that gaslighting sort of thrives on isolation. The other thing is shame. So I think shame is a huge component of how gaslighting works. Um, and, you know, people who might gaslight another person, might manipulate that sense of shame to sort of keep someone isolated, keep them silent about what's going on. So like, oh, you're just seeking attention by claiming this. Or so many of the people I interview um, experience gaslighting from their parents around experiences, let's say, of childhood sexual abuse. This is a really common um, theme that comes up. So if you've experienced sexual abuse as a child, you tell people about it or you talk to your parents about it, and they say like, no, you didn't, that didn't happen. You're making that up for attention. You must have really wanted something like that, something like this, right? So the experience of sexual abuse is already wrapped up in all kinds of shame 
And then when people sort of manipulate that to keep you sort of quiet about it or to deny that that happened because they can't face it for themselves, whatever the reasons are that that might happen, I think shame really surrounds this. And that sort of compounds isolation, compounds depression, um, and these other feelings that might come up around gaslighting. I think people who experience gaslighting over long periods of time, like in, abu in you know, long-term abusive relationships, um, that can lead to, you know, it's a really traumatizing experience that can lead to all sorts of mental health effects. Um, and I think, you know, in general, just in sort of a larger sense, all forms of psychological abuse are really invisible. And we tend to really only prioritize or think about something as abusive when it's physically abusive, like when someone has the black eye, right, or the bruise, or those like really classic physical indicators of abuse. But victims of domestic violence have been telling us for decades that psychological abuse is the most damaging, that it stays with them the longest and has the most devastating effects. And so I think we really need to take that seriously and think about how letting it remain invisible as a society, right, just compounds those effects. Are there any steps that people who are experiencing gaslighting can take to remove themselves from the situation? That's a good question. I mean, I think one of the things that makes me happy about gaslighting becoming a more popular term is that I think it gives us a sort of resource to understand what might be happening to us when we get that feeling in our stomach that like, oh God, something's wrong here. Like someone's telling me that something didn't happen to me and I know it did, um, or whatever the, the context is. So I think, um, I think that's a good thing. I think having these terms out more in the public sphere, paying more attention to psychological abuse, I think all of those things give us resources to sort of push back against um, any attempts to sort of like deny or distort our realities, and especially if it's a part of a larger social context in which you're being discriminated against or harmed in other ways. Um, so I think that's really important. The other thing is that counter narratives piece that I mentioned earlier. So um, one thing that's important is that if you feel like something like this is happening to you, um, it's important to sort of reach out to social networks and talk to people about the experience as hard as that may be, maybe a trusted friend or family member to begin with, to say like, am I really crazy, right? Because if someone's making you feel that way, probably they're the one doing something wrong. Um, and so I think that that's really important to sort of seek out that counter narrative. Um, you know, I think in terms of um, escaping or getting out of a relationship, especially if it's an intimate relationship, um, the resources that domestic violence advocates and organizations have been developing for many decades around how to escape an abusive relationship are really valuable here. Um, and so that's about creating a safety plan for when this kind of things happen, the, when this kind of thing happens, who can I call right away? Do I have access to transportation to leave the situation? Um, if it's happening in a, in a workplace, for example, um, is there, do I have enough savings built up so I could leave this job, um, you know, even if I don't have something to hold me over in the meantime. So those kinds of safety planning so that you know, like, okay, if this gets bad enough, I would be able to leave the situation. Thinking ahead to that kind of thing can make you sort of feel like you have more control over the situation. During the month of May, we recognize and celebrate Mental Health Awareness Month. Could you share a little bit of your own perspective on Mental Health Awareness Month and what we should be focusing on as we reflect on our well-being? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, one of the most important findings, I think, of research on psychological abuse in general or gaslighting specifically is that the effects of these types of manipulations are worse for people who lack strong social networks or who lack material resources like money, transportation, things like that, which serve as protections. Um, and I think that's what we, that's what I want to focus on um, in something like Mental Health Awareness Month is that we're actually less dependent on abusive people or abusive settings if we 
have access to a living wage, to child care, to safe housing, to all of these material resources. So I think before we can talk about really mental health and well-being, we need the structural supports of that well-being. Um, and that's what really studying this topic from a sociological perspective, um, since I'm trained as a sociologist, really brings, is that we need to have social contexts and structural supports that really promote well-being. So I think we can talk all we want about getting out and finding a better partner. But many of the people that I interview are like, you know, stuck in these relationships, not because they don't want to leave, but because they can't leave, because they don't have the sort of material resources to be able to just pick up and go. And so I think that's what I want to cast some light on, right, is that when we're talking about crises of mental health, crises of psychological abuse, we're often talking about crises of inequality. And I think that that's a sort of really important piece that I, as a sociologist, want to emphasize. Like, we all deserve self-determination. We all deserve autonomy. We all deserve to be able to realize our sort of like our sort of own wishes for our well-being. Um, we all deserve to live lives free from manipulation, free from violence. Um, but those things require certain like social conditions, right, to be able to achieve that. We're not all set up equally to be able to live lives free from violence and manipulation. Um, and so I think we have to advocate for each other. We have to help build that for each other. People can't really be what I think of sort of safe in your mind without the kind of material resources of safety. Um, and so that's kind of what I try to focus on when I think about what does it mean to take a, a sociological approach to something like psychological abuse. You've mentioned different um, resources and advocacy, but are there any supportive or educational resources specifically that you would like to mention? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, like I said, one of the good things about this term becoming so popular is actually tons of great resources online. Um, I would recommend um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline um, as a resource and website. So there's a hotline that you can actually physically, you know, like pick up the phone and call. Um, but you can also do like a chat online and just talk to someone, a real person, um, about your experiences. And the thing is, domestic violence advocates, whether or not you're also experiencing other features of domestic violence, like physical abuse. Domestic violence advocates are real experts in helping you figure out that sort of mind-bending manipulation stuff, no matter who it's coming from, anyone in your life. It could be a friend or family member as well, um, and they would be well positioned to help you figure that kind of thing out. So they also offer on their websites the National Domestic Violence Hotline, National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. These kinds of resources offer um, sort of websites um, or sort of pages on their larger sites that sort of describe what gaslighting is and might be able to help you figure out if that is indeed what's happening to you. So whether or not you reach out, you can at least seek sort of informational, um, you can at least seek information through those places. Thank you. And we will include that in our show notes and in the article that accompanies the podcast. And as the podcast recording comes to a close, what is one thing that you hope all listeners remember from this conversation? I think I hope that people remember that gaslighting and psychological abuse don't take place in a vacuum, that they're part of a sort of broader social context. And it's important that we really pay attention to sort of power differentials in those larger social con contexts in order to really address something like gaslighting. Is there anything else that you would like to share before we wrap up? No, I don't think so. I'm, I'm happy to be included in this. And I think, um, you know, shining light on the sort of mental health effects and the social effects of people's experiences of, of psychological abuse is, um, it's really important to me and really sort of core to the work that I do. So I'm really happy to be included. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sweet, for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Michigan Minds podcast a production of the University of Michigan. Join the conversation on social media with hashtag UMichImpact.